Hey everyone, welcome to Chapel. I'm super excited because we have a guest speaker today. You may know him if you're a TCE OG. He's a sixth grade teacher and has made a huge impact in so many people's lives. We're so blessed to have Mr. Buston here to share his message. Now before we get into worship, I have a quick announcement. Next week is Spirit Week. Even though it's only promised only for juniors and seniors, everyone is invited to participate in Spirit Week. Monday is PJ Day. Tuesday is Dress Like a Teacher Day. Wednesday is Dress Like a Movie or TV Character Day. Thursday is Color Wars because juniors and seniors won't be here on Friday. And Friday is Red Carpet Day. So even if you can't go to prom, you still have a day to dress up. Now, as we prepare for worship, I know there's some of you in here who are struggling. Your plate is loaded. You want to focus, but your heads, your mind's in a thousand different places and your heart is being torn apart. Maybe you're still thinking about a fight you had with your parents before you left for school, or a test you have next period, or maybe it's a health issue that's going on in your family. Whatever it may be, you're just not feeling worship today. But when we worship with God, it helps us look beyond our own circumstances. With our own eyes, we see what's visible in the world around us and what's humanly possible. But when we shift our eyes off ourselves and onto God, we're able to see what God wants us to see. Worship helps us see his power, his love, and his plan. So whether you came today pumped for chapel or you came in with a heavy heart, I encourage you to worship and shift your focus onto God. So stand with me as we transition into a time of worship. Let's pray. God, I just thank you for this day. I thank you that we can come here and we can worship. God, I pray that you would open hearts and you would change lives, God. We're ready to hear what you have to say. Speak through Mr. Butson. Give him the power to just deliver your message, God. And I just pray that we'd have a great rest of the day. God, we love you. We're so thankful for you. Amen. Let's worship. Thank you. 
bless the rest of this chapel, and I pray that you'll bless Mr. Butson as he speaks. In your name I pray, amen. You may be seated. What's going on, everybody? If uh, many of you know me and maybe even try to forget about some of the time that we spent together, um, if you don't know me, again, my name is Mr. Butson. Uh, it's a pretty recognizable name. I teach at the elementary school. I have for uh, about 12 years now. Uh, I'm also a TC alum. Al alum, alumni, alumness. I don't know what the correct, I don't know. You're smarter than me, you probably know. Uh, so I remember sitting where you are. Uh, I was usually right back here uh, in chapel. So I, I want to be able to level with you a little bit in that I, I have sat where you have sat. I will also openly admit, as someone who is not on social media, actually, I am now. I got on my Facebook two days ago for the first time since my five-year-old was born. So yes, I'm a little detached. Uh, but I will openly admit that when I was in high school, I did not have to try to do high school uh, with a phone, with the internet at my fingertips, with social media. I, I can't imagine the struggle that that is. It, there's great things to it, but I also know that it adds some, uh, some difficulty. So, uh, I want to actually get to some of my high school story as we're going to talk this idea, about this idea of uh, how we curate our stories. Uh, a curator is someone who works at maybe like a, a museum, and they organize and arrange the displays so that people see them the way they want to, uh, so that people get to experience the exhibit in a certain way. So when I was in high school, uh, I felt the need to... Uh, curate or spin my story uh, in a certain way. I wanted people to see a certain version of me. And so if I can uh, say so myself, I had the Christian school game down. I knew what I was doing. So for one, most Fridays, you could see me standing right here for worship team. Uh, we would sing, shout to the Lord. Okay, I won't tell you how many years ago that was, uh, but if you know how far back Newsboys and Audio Adrenaline goes, uh, yep, those were some of our songs, okay? So I was here. That was, that was something I enjoyed doing. Uh, I was a basketball player in here. Uh, I can humbly say I was a good basketball player. So many awesome memories from being in here with my teammates, uh, some of whom are still lifelong friends. Again, great memories on each. If anything, I scored the first basket on that rim when this gym was built. But it was in a JV game, so I don't get credit for it. Sorry, JV folks. I loved the sportsmanship at, uh, uh, side of the basketball game, being able to go to a referee and put my arm around them and, and talk in the middle of a game or the ball went out of bounds and give little kids on the sideline pounds. Right? I love that stuff. Uh, I was on student council. 
I don't really remember what I did on student council, but I was on student council, uh, and I prided myself on being a good friend. Uh, if you know any Enneagram, I'm a seven, so my friendships always have been super important to me. Those were the things that I loved that I put out there for people to see. I prided myself on those. But then we all know, if we kind of consider our own, your own high school story, that there's other stuff that we don't want people to see. There's things that we curate in a certain way so that they kind of get locked up. For one, I was a very lazy student. I am very particularly right now not making eye contact with many teachers because some of them had me. I was not a committed student. That came back to bite me in the butt because uh, I had to really relearn how to be a student. And sadly, I didn't figure that out in college well either. I was prideful. When it came to basketball, everything looked good, but a lot of it was about me. So when I woke up every Sunday morning, I'd go downstairs, get my bowl of cereal, and back then we had to get our uh, statistics for sports and all that for the area in the newspaper. So my dad would already be reading it, and I'd sit down and I'd grab the sports section to see where I ranked in the area in points and rebounds. Because I wanted to know. And then the next week, I knew exactly where I stood. Or I'd be up here singing on worship team and uh, as one of like kind of the senior leaders of it, uh, there was a song that I would lead every week we did it. And in my mind, some roots kind of dug in of pride that would say, oh, well, yeah, that's like my song. And then I remember one week in particular, I was standing right here. Like it's, even as I'm standing here, I didn't do this in the junior high chapel, but right now it is. Like I'm flashing back to that moment. Uh, we finished the song and it would end pretty hard, and then this note would lay out, and just kind of this uh, feeling sat over the room. You know what those are like. And the worship leader from a local church was up here helping us lead. Uh, and I'm like, yes, that was great. And then he starts into the chorus again. And I remember standing here and just in my heart shooting him a glare and going, that's not how the, my song goes. <laughs> That's like a serious pride issue for someone who's trying to lead people in worship. I had other sin that was rooted down deep that I did not want a soul to know. It would ruin all that reputation and story that I had worked so hard to put out. Most people saw that good side, and I loved that, and there were some people who saw the bad side. But man, we all like to curate what people see of us. And this isn't relegated, again, to kids in elementary school or junior high high schoolers or immature college kids. Like, this is, this is a human issue. It's everybody. Uh, last night, uh, my wife and I stayed up. We were watching The Greatest Showman, and I, I, this line just hit where one of the characters looks at Zac Efron as he's showing up to the circus. And uh, she says, well, what, what's your act? He says, I don't have an act. I'm not one of the performers. She says, no, everybody has an act. We all have something we put out there. So I want you to think for a second. I want you to go back to your spring break. Just run it back to some of your highs and lows real quick. What was the good? What was the bad? What was the ugly? What was the highlights and the lowlights? If we take your highlights, the things that you would want everybody to know, we're going to put them into two categories. The first category is going to be status moments. Okay, these status moments are the things that you want everybody to see because they were fun, they were cool. Uh, people would be so jealous of what you got to do. It elevates your social standing. Those are our status moments. The next one's going to be our sympathy getters. We all have those things that uh, maybe they were sad, maybe they were drama. Whatever it is, we know if we put it out there, people are going to feel so bad for us. Sympathy getters. Whichever one of those you put out, 
You are presenting yourself in a way that will change how people view you, but you're changing how they view you so that you have the advantage. You get to set the rules. And so we're very particular on what goes out and how it goes out. What are the things from your spring break then that you decided not to share? What did you leave out on purpose? Maybe it was just the boring stuff. Maybe you stayed in the uh, hotbed of Troy, Ohio, and you did not put out that you were eating reheated mac and cheese for lunch for the second day in a row. Maybe you did post that but because you wanted people to feel bad for you, right? But no, you didn't just, you didn't post all the boring stuff. Uh, you probably didn't post all of the things that were truly hard in your life. The, uh, hey, I got to go on this sweet trip, but my parents, they fought the whole time. Or man, I was with my mom this week, but, oh, it went bad. My older sibling is stuck in this and it's really having a, a negative effect on our family. Or if you only knew what happened, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, we definitely don't put those out unless we want the attention for them. Or just your own real struggles, your contentment issues. If your best friend is posting videos from some sweet vacation over spring break and you're stuck in Troy, your response to them might be, oh, I'm so glad you're having fun. But really, your heart might not be that bright and sunny. <clears throat> Maybe you've got pride issues, like, like I gave my example of. Maybe you have your own sin that is just rooted so deep and in these dark places that you don't feel like you could admit to anybody because it's between you and God and secretly like you're kind of cutting off the God part of that because you hope he doesn't see it either. Or maybe you just want to have control. Control of whatever it is. We spend so much time and energy, so much physical time and energy, but so much spiritual time and energy trying to curate and spin our story so that the way we are seen works to our advantage. Uh, scripture gives us an alternative to curating these stories. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7 gives us just this great nugget of a verse that is this deep spiritual truth that we all know if you go back to it, right? It says, we walk by faith and not by sight. But you've, you've heard that one, I don't know how many times. This idea of walking by faith is a living by faith, a walking out on a daily basis, our faith. So when we walk versus when we curate, we get a little bit of comparison here. When we walk, we move forward. We are moving towards a goal, towards something that the Lord has in front of us. When we curate, we lift ourselves up. We haven't traveled anywhere. We've just elevated ourselves over everybody else. We've put the priority on us. When we walk, we have our eyes on what's ahead of us. We are looking to what's coming next. Versus when we curate, we've just got our eyes focused down on us. We're just looking inward on what what we want to get put out there. And even then, a lot of times it ends up with us looking down on other people. So Hebrews 11 is going to give us this great example in Scripture of how this played out for really these like Bible heroes. Hebrews 11 is uh, the hall of fame of faith. I still uh, remember pretty vividly, uh, I think it was the freshman class, like we talked about this on the missions trip on the last day. We've got this list of people who did amazing things when they walked by faith. So I'm going to, if you have your Bible, you can open it there. I'm not going to put it on the screen. I'm just going to run through this list. 
We're going to do it pretty quick. I'll dive into some side stories a little bit because there's some cool things to know in there. Uh, But we're going to run through it pretty quick. Uh, Abel, right? Cain and Abel. Abel, by faith, brought a better sacrifice, a better gift to God. Enoch pleased God and got taken to heaven before he ever died. That's cool. That only happened to a couple people. Noah built an ark, which would have made him look like a crazy man back then. Abraham left his home and went to the promised land. He left the inheritance he was going to have and the leadership and all the things he was going to gain. And scripture says he was looking forward to a city with foundations whose architect and builder was God. He was moving forward into this thing that God was going to do, that God was going to build. It wasn't there yet. Abraham also, once he had a child, offered that child as a sacrifice. Sarah had a baby. Now, let's just remember that Abraham and Sarah were told they were going to have a baby when they were already old. Now, don't just think like kind of old for having a baby. Just straight up for Abraham, just think like crusty old dude. And was told he was going to have a baby. Isaac blessed his son Jacob. Jacob blessed his sons. Moses' parents hid Moses in the reeds, in a basket, in the Nile, with the crocodiles and the hippopotamuses. Uh, And they did this because when they, Scripture says when they looked at their son, they saw that he was no ordinary child. I don't even know what that means. I got three kids. When I look at my kids when they were born, I'm like, oh, snap, this is no ordinary kid. But if scripture says that Moses distinguishes Moses as no ordinary child, I don't even know what that means. I don't even know what that looks like. Moses, when he had grown, rejected his Egyptian upbringing in the palace of his people and left Egypt and the people out. The Israelites, as they were led out, passed through the Red Sea on dry land and the walls of Jericho fell when they marched around it. Rahab welcomed the spies from Israel. Barak uh, let Deborah lead the armies of Israel. Samson was God's tool against the Philistines. Jephthah uh, obeyed God. David was a man after God's own heart. Samuel was God's messenger to Israel. And the prophets foretold the coming of Jesus. These are all the things these people did by faith. But as I run through that list and you hear those names, there's probably... Some of those names you're hearing where you're going like, yeah, but I can think of this guy. He made like all these dumb decisions. So now in fairness, <laughs> we're going to run through some of these dumb decisions, right? The, the writer of Hebrews doesn't leave those out just so we ignore them. He's highlighting what they did when they walked by faith. But let's look at what happens when they put it into their own hands. Abraham lied to protect his wife rather than trusting God when they were in Egypt. Uh, Remember, he said his wife was his sister. I don't know. I can imagine that wouldn't go well in the first place. But because of he did that to save his own skin. So Sarah was beautiful, and he knew the Egyptians would think she was beautiful, and so they'd kill him and try to take her. But his sin in trying to cover his own butt meant a bunch of Egyptians died. His sin led to uh, something the Egyptians had to pay for. He wanted control of it. Uh, Once he had a child, or sorry, he had a child with his servant just to be sure that God's plan was going to work. Again, taking control of the situation. Isaac did the same thing that uh, Abraham did in lying about who his wife was to try to keep himself safe. Jacob tricked his brother uh, for his birthright. Moses killed an Egyptian to try to be the savior of his people. He also didn't get to enter the promised land because he made his own sketchy leadership decisions. Uh, The Israelites, not long after leaving Egypt, built the golden calf and then whined and complained about wanting to go back to Egypt, so much so that God actually talked to Abraham, or talked to Moses, and said, like, hey, these people down there, like, they're whining and complaining. I want to wipe them out and start over with you. And Moses had to be like, no, 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 that's not how you work. Rahab was a prostitute. We're just going to leave that one there. 
Barak didn't trust God up front, so a woman had to step into leadership. Samson was a womanizer. David had the Bathsheba situation. All of these people had these mistakes that they had already made, these ways that they had tried to take control and curate their story already. They all tried to write their own story, but the author of Hebrews tells us that the things these people did happened when they walked by faith, not when they reacted to the situation based on what they saw, but when they responded to God's call to walk with him. And our call is to walk by faith. The things we do, the things that God will do when we walk by faith are the things that are worth being known for. They're far better than the stories that we decide to curate and put out there. So as we're talking about putting things out there, I, I want to, uh, I have a, an illustration, and I want you to know that both for the illustration and just kind of this message for you guys as a whole, I am not trying to like get you to ditch social media and cell phones. That is not the goal here. But I'm gonna use our cell phones as a little bit of an example. How many of you in the last 24 hours have gotten stuck scrolling something on your cell phone, right? Where you just blank out to the whole world around you. Can I get like an honest raise of hands? Okay. I think we can probably add 30% to that still. Whether this is uh, YouTube videos, whether this is scrolling Instagram, whether this is... Uh, uh, like one of my holes can be looking at shoes still or sports stuff. Uh, it is easy for us to get, again, sucked in there and just not even recognize the world around us. Our eyes are down and just focused on us or what we want or what we want to do or how we wish our life was different. Or if we're posting on social media, it's, again, it's curating our story. But when we experience, in a physical sense, freedom from our phones, we get to physically move through the world and experience it by being present with it. Uh, we get to go to, to Canada most summers. We hang out at a lake all week in the wilderness. And we get to turn off our cell phones when we get there and put them in the armrest of the minivan and not touch them for 10 days. Now, some of you, like, your heart just started beating hard thinking about that idea. Some of you think that sounds like a great idea. I am a better dad and a better husband that week because I can be present in the world because I'm looking at what is, in, uh, what is ahead of me, what the Lord has put there. When we stop crafting our story and walk where God moves us, we get to see the needs around us. We can respond to whatever the Holy Spirit is moving us to, and we can do the things by God's power that we can't by ours. Again, this is not the get rid of your cell phone. This is just the mindset of, when we, of putting what we want out there to be seen a certain way as a whole. So I'm going to, uh, just little... You know, example before we get into some reflection here. Uh, you guys remember LT, right? My oldest. Okay. Uh, any guesses how old LT is now? So I got a seven. Seven. It's a good guess. Ten. Uh, he is ten, right? He's taller than some of you, I bet. The kid's a monster. Okay, uh, we got to, I've been coaching his basketball the last few years, got to coach him again this year. Uh, and I hit a point where every year, uh, some of you still, you might remember, like I like my shoe game being on point. Uh, I used to like to wear as many different shoes throughout his basketball games in the year as I could. Rotate and see if I could wear something different every week. I had to make the personal choice this year not to wear my cool gray Jordan 11s to one of LT's basketball games. It wouldn't have been a bad thing if I did, but I had this realization as I pulled them out from under the bed before a game. 
I was putting those on, not just because they were sweet and comfortable and one of the most beautiful shoes ever made, ever, but because I wanted credibility from other people in the gym. I wanted the respect that came with people knowing that my shoe game was on point and the high school referees who were helping us out would be into them. I was doing it for the attention and to try to tell people something about me that really came down to a pride issue. I was trying to curate the story. So here's your first question that I want you to think about if you want to write it down a little bit, uh, write some thoughts. How do you curate your story? Maybe you've never thought about that before. Maybe as I started bringing this up, you're like, well, I don't do that. Just think for a second, how do you curate your story? How do you craft and spin things about you so that people see you a certain way and it works to your advantage? And then your second question here. What is one thing, just one thing, that you can do next week to try to let go of the curating, okay, kind of open-handed, give that to the Lord, and walk by faith? Okay, I'm not telling you don't wear your sweet shoes. I'm not telling you give up social media for the week unless you're feeling those things. But what's something you can do to stop curating and walk closer with God next week? Because in doing that, God can do way more with someone who's walking with him than someone who's next to him but super distracted and super self-involved and just needs to be in control of what we put out there. Let's, uh, let's pray. God, I thank you for today. I thank you for the opportunity to be here. I thank you for uh, everybody in here that you have brought them to chapel today, uh, to this place. Uh, I thank you for uh, the relationship that you have blessed me to be able to have with uh, so many students in here over the years, that you would continue to do that. Stoke some more of that where it hasn't been able to happen this past year, Lord. Lord, be with us as we are moving forward into this week. As we get a weekend and then getting back to school. And uh, Lord, as we try to, to let go of the control, to not feel like we have to organize and craft and spin a story so that people see us a certain way. But that we can walk in faith with you. And God, the things that you will do with us as we walk like that are the things that are worth being known for. Those are the ways that uh, we want to be seen by walking with you and doing your will in that, Lord. We love you. Amen. Yeah, let's go ahead and thank Mr. for his message. Just a couple announcements before we dismiss. Um, even though Friday chapels are back, next week's chapel will be on Thursday because prom is on Friday and juniors and seniors won't have to be here. So we're going to have chapel on Thursday when the whole student body is here. And this upcoming Thursday, we are bringing back guest speaker Terrell Carter. So that's given you something to look forward to. And with all that being said, we will see you next week for Spirit Week um, and Prom Week. You are dismissed. If my fourth period Bible class and senior lounge students can help put chairs away, that'd be